I was mentioning, I had done a similar talk to this about a month ago. And when I was looking at um, my notes from that talk, things have changed a fair bit in the last month already. So the last one was right around when spring break was ending and nobody knew what was with going back to school. And so now people have been doing, you know, back to school from home and all of those things. So I'm going to try and touch on some of what the current concerns have been. Um, but I wanted to start off, um, let me just, sorry, um, pull something up on my screen. So I just wanted to start off by speaking a little bit about anxiety um, in children and adolescents in general. So the number one thing that I like to start off talking about is that anxiety itself, the emotion, is a normal emotion. We all feel it, um, especially during times of uncertainty. And it's an adaptive um, emotion to a certain extent that, you know, anxiety keeps us safe. It keeps us on alert. If we had no anxiety and um, no kind of uh, worries about danger around us, we'd cross the street without looking, potentially. We do all sorts of things. So it's something that's adaptive. It keeps us safe. It helps us stay out of danger. However, obviously anxiety can become problematic when it gets to a point that there isn't any danger in front of you, but you're still spending a lot of time worrying or having that kind of anxious response in your body or in your thoughts. <clears throat> so many anxious kids have a sensitive temperament. A lot of um, the children I work with, their parents describe them as since a young age as being quite sensitive and, and worrisome or anxious. Um, and that's pretty common. Another thing that you know I often talk about is that many anxious children also do have an anxious parent. It's not uncommon. There is a genetic component to this. Um, there's also the aspect of modeling responses to things. And so um, I will be talking uh, a little bit during this talk about as parents how we can also model appropriate reactions to worries and uncertainty and um, all the things that are especially coming up with COVID right now. Um, so in, in thinking about kind of normal anxiety and when to be a bit more concerned about your child or adolescent's anxiety, I'd say, you know, a, a normal, a normal, whatever that means, amount of anxiety is manageable with support. So, you know, with a little bit of extra, um, a little bit of extra support, a little bit of extra attention, um, some front loading, some structuring, like doing a little bit of kind of extra, the anxiety is okay. It's not interfering with the child's life or impacting them in a really significant way. So when it's more worrisome um, would be when uh, things like uh, your child doesn't settle with supportive strategies. Um, for little kids, sometimes we see regressions in behavior or really big changes in their behavior. So if your child was kind of doing really well, or let's say a young one who is um, totally potty trained and then like a preschooler and then suddenly they start having accidents. Like that might be a sign of like, hmm, there might be something going on. They might be feeling extra stress around them right now. Um, you know, kids seeing that your child is getting excessively upset or distressed or that the, the intensity of their reaction is kind of disproportionate to the actual things that are going on right now, that would be something that would be kind of a cue of like, maybe, maybe this is something else. Um, and the big one I think about is when it's interfering with day to day functioning, like when anxiety is getting to the point that you can't get out the door, or you can't get your child to sleep for hours, or they can't participate in events that there's that other kids or kids their age should be able to do. So things like going to participate in birthday parties, obviously not right now, um, or sporting events or things like that. But like, for example, right now, not being able to participate in classroom online calls could be a sign of anxiety that they can't keep up and do the things that the other kids are doing. And so 
you know, in general, when I'm meeting families, it, when I become worried or, or say, yes, this is something we need to look at or work on is when it's really interfering with day-to-day -day life for the child and for the family, and that the child is not getting to do the things that they want to do. That to me is a big one. Like this child wants to go on a sleepover, but they're too anxious to, or they want to go to that birthday party or play on the soccer team, but it makes them too anxious. Those are the times that I say, Let's give them some strategies to manage that so they can do those things. And, you know, one of the things that I, I like to think about when we're talking about worrying is that when we worry, we actually, we increase the dangers in our minds and we shrink our own personal resources. And this is something I talk about with kids. Like we're overestimating the danger or the threat that is around us. And, and what's important is we're also underestimating our own ability to deal with that. So that's just kind of a little bit of background on anxiety in general. And I wanted to kind of march right into um, you know, COVID specifically and anxiety, what's happening right now and some specific um, coping tools that people can be using to manage or help their child manage the, their own anxiety and worries. So the number one thing I talk about with parents to start off with when um, we're talking about your child's anxiety is what's happening with your own anxiety? Like how are, how do you handle these things? What, what, kind of reaction do you have to things around you in your world? So, you know, when all of this started, some of the questions I would have had for parents was like, how are you feeling about COVID? Are you stressed about getting it? Are you stressed about um, your parents or your own health or your family's health? You know, and, and if you are stressed about that, how is that coming out? You know, if, your child coughs around you um, and isn't great about covering their mouths or um, washing their hands. Like, is that creating a lot of stress for you? Are you are you are you kind of raising your voice because you're like, don't do that because it's creating some anxiety, um, you know? And then also recognizing that a lot of parents right now are going through really high levels of their own stress. I mean, I really think parents need to acknowledge that, you know, it's a lot right now for parents. It's a lot to, you know, for some parents, it means both parents are working, but from home and your children are home and you're somehow supposed to um, homeschool them or at least help them get through whatever it is their particular school is assigning to them while balancing potentially a full-time job. Other parents are really stressed because they're not working and they've lost their jobs and there are huge financial stresses that come with that. And while they're coping with that, they're also trying to cope with a new role of being home and being with their children and again, helping with school and all of those things. And also, I think that it's important to keep in mind that a lot of the things that we as parents would do normally to release our stress or cope with our stress are not necessarily options that are available right now. So seeing our friends, going out for a nice meal and chatting with your closest friends about the struggles you have with parenting. You can't do that now. I mean, you can have Zoom calls and those are great and I definitely recommend them. Um, but you know, that's not necessarily an option. Or, you know, some people would go to gyms every day or several times a week to release their stress. And that's not an option. And um, exercising at home with children might be a challenge. You know, normal support, support networks might not be available. So there are a lot of stresses, truly, that are happening for parents. So one of the things that I always recommend is that parents are checking in with their own anxiety and also taking on some tools to better manage and also model really good coping skills. Um, and so whether that's through um, your own kind of 
supports, support network, online resources. I'll talk a little bit about some of these or have some of them in a resources page at the end, your own counseling, you know, whatever it may be, finding ways to exercise, finding ways to go for a walk by yourself to unwind before you transition from, you know, morning to being with your kids, having a, getting up half an hour before your kids do just to have a quiet cup of coffee or tea or work out before your kids are up, like finding some thing in your day that helps you cope better. Because we know from that, you know, that example of on the airplane, when the oxygen masks come down, you got to put yours on first, or you're not going to be able to help your kids get theirs on and take care of them. And it's the same thing through times of stress like this, you've got to be able to manage your own stress um, in order to help your children manage theirs. Um, you know, in terms of helping your child, one of the things that is really important is really checking in with your kids. And you know, listening to, to them in terms of how they're feeling through all this, like regular check-ins about how they're managing, how are they managing not seeing their friends, you know, are they stressed or worried about things, what kind of things, how's um, school from home working out for them, like really hearing how they're feeling and also listening to um, what it is they've been hearing about the world or the situation, um, either through their friends, because even through Zoom calls with their classmates, kids are talking about, well, I heard, you know, I heard we're going back to, I heard we're not going back to school. I've heard this, like they're sharing that stuff, depending on the age, obviously, but, um, and they're also listening to the news a little bit, right? Like a lot of families have the news on or they have um, notifications of headlines coming up from news apps and kids depending on the age and teens for sure are seeing that so you know number one is to listen to how they're feeling and to empathize with their emotions to validate how they're feeling you know saying things like yeah this is really hard like you know, it's hard not seeing our friends. I, I get that. Like, you love your friends. You love to be at school with these people. Or I hear that you're worried about your grandparents. Or, or just that, yeah, uncertainty is hard. Like, not knowing when you get to go back to school or when things are going to change, that's, that is really hard. And then when it comes to things like what they're talking about with their friends around COVID or what they've heard, asking them, like, what have you heard? what what do you what's your understanding of this and and correcting any misinformation addressing any myths um you know providing them simple facts at their developmental level so you don't need to give them more than they necessarily are asking but i also recommend not to shield kids entirely from what's going on so you know giving them facts but in in an age appropriate way um, because when parents don't share info with kids or say like, don't, you don't need to worry about that or just kind of get quiet around certain things, kids, kids are very perceptive. They're listening and they're aware. And so when you don't share, you run the risk of children having misinformation in their minds um, or for especially our worried kids who have great imaginations, they're actually creating potentially a way worse scenario than is actually happening. And so it's a great opportunity to check in with them and speak with them and ask them what they know and correct it and just give them the simple facts because having true information in and of itself can help bring some worries down. And the last thing on that point is just to remember that it's always okay to say that you don't know or you don't have all the answers. You know, you can say, I don't know, but I'll find that out for you. Or when I, you know, I don't know that now, but when I do, I'll definitely share it with you. So some of the kids are starting to ask about what the summer is going to look like, or they're continuing to ask, when are we going to go back to school? And we don't have a lot of those answers right now. We have, we don't know. And I, it's totally, I, I would say as a parent, it's better to say to your child, I don't know, than to say, I think that we're going to, I think this is what's going to happen. And then have a child be disappointed or really expecting that outcome. And it, it doesn't end up happening. 
Um, I think it's really important, like I was talking about, to provide information. Um, and it's okay to provide your child a little bit of reassurance during these days when things are uncertain. Um, and kids do need a little bit extra these days to know that, um, you know, we're all working hard. We're all doing what we need to be doing to stay healthy. You know, we can talk about how our community are all working together to keep us safe, um, you know, community initiatives to kind of work together. Like we're all doing our part and that's what's the best we can do to keep ourselves safe and, and we're doing everything we can. So, you know, those kinds of messages. Um, it's also okay to let them know that maybe we're all a little bit anxious or stressed in these uncertain times because worry is normal. But, you know, I think what happens sometimes is that um, kids, kids get anxious and they start um, seeking a lot of reassurance from parents. So they start asking similar questions over and over like, is, let's say, is, is grandma gonna get sick? Is grandma gonna die? Or am I gonna catch this? Or did I wash my hands enough? Um, do I need to wash them again? What happens if, you know, so if they're asking lots of these kinds of anxious questions, that's a great opportunity to kind of notice that that's their worries and learn to handle that a little bit differently. So, um, so the thing about reassurance is that it's a good fix in the short term. So when a child says like, am I going to get sick? Or I touched that, am I going to get sick? And you say, no, you're going to be fine. And then they do it again. And you say, no, you're going to be fine. No, you're going to be fine. Well, it's a bottomless pit. Like they're just going to keep asking it because it's, it's a quick fix. It's like a band-aid, like it just helps in that moment, but it doesn't actually help reduce anxiety in the long term. In fact, what it does is it fuels the anxiety further because the child then starts to feel reliant on you, um, that you're the one who can bring down their anxiety. Like by asking you and you having the answer, you can bring that down rather than them feeling empowered to manage their own anxiety. And sometimes inadvertently when we do a lot of reassurance, it also can sometimes give children the message that there is actual danger and that they really do need you to help them with it. So they don't learn that this is the anxiety driving it. They learn that I need, I need mom to keep me safe or I need dad to keep me safe. So I know that providing reassurance um, is really hard. I say that both as a psychologist and as a parent who has a reassurance seeker at home. Um, it's really hard. Our natural instinct as parents is to make our kids feel better. Like really, that's what we wanna do. We want our kids to not feel discomfort. That's kind of our natural instinct. It's, but it doesn't, it's not always the best for our anxious kids. So our natural instinct is to go, you'll be okay, it's okay, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Um, but like I said, that's gonna fuel the anxiety rather than help them to manage it. And it's not um, serving our child well when we remove all their discomfort um, as much as that's what we want to do. We really want to have in mind for our kids that they need to learn to manage discomfort because that's a big part of life. Like life will not be without discomfort. And if you can start at a young age helping your child to tolerate some discomfort, not huge amounts, not like exposing them to something really scary and like leaving, you know, but, but being like, hey, like sounds like the, that's the worries. Oh, the worries are back. Oh, or hey, you asked me that before and I answered the question. Do you remember what my answer was? Oh, you do. Awesome. That's great. So let's, let's move on. Right. So those are great ways to kind of point out that this seems like the anxiety and what could you do to manage it? Um, or, or to be even more clear, like you already know the answer to that. So I'm not going to answer it. Or if they ask a question, you know, am I going to get sick if I, if I touch that? Well, what do you think? 
What do you think is going to happen? And then you can correct misinformation without providing reassurance seeking. But I tend to say avoid statements like don't worry or you won't get sick. Um, I don't like saying things like you won't get sick or grandma won't get sick um, as reassurance because it might not be true. Like you can't predict the future, you don't know for sure. And when you give a very black and white answer to your child, it sets you up potentially for, you know, saying something that's not true. And later, if let's say your child does get sick or grandma gets sick, your child will feel like, well, mom just says things to make me feel better, but it's not necessarily the truth. So you want your child, and I'm saying mom just because I'm a mom, but you know, or dad, like you want, you want to be able to, um, to say to them, like, you know, we're all doing what we can to stay healthy. That's why we are physically distancing. That's why we are washing our hands um, rather than don't worry, you won't get sick. You'll be fine. Right. We're doing, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and we're all taking this seriously and we're all doing what we can. And that's our job in this. That's our responsibility. Um, and then, you know, praising them when you notice that they're managing their worries better or they're not seeking reassurance, but answering those questions for themselves. That's so a great moment to be like, Hey, you, you may, like, I saw that you kind of were going to ask me that, or you started to ask, but then you answered it yourself. That's awesome. Like you, you just like bossed back your own worries. So that's really good. So kind of giving praise when, when you see them shifting into managing their worries better. Um, one of the questions I, I've been asked a little bit is um, with the new emphasis on hand washing is are we kind of creating a younger generation who will become germaphobes or develop um, OCD around hand washing? Um, I, I'm not a, a fortune teller. I don't know for sure. Um, I think that, you know, there is that potential for kids, especially those who are already a bit on the worrisome side, to start um, hand washing uh, more than they need to or longer than they need to, where it's fueled by anxiety rather than um, a normal amount of we wash our hands to stay clean um, and healthy. I think that, um, I think realistically, like hand washing is going to have a different emphasis in our lives in general for some time to come. So I think that when kids go back to school, I think, you know, I know, for example, when my kids were still in school before spring break, their teacher was having them um, wash my younger ones who were in elementary school were having them wash hands several times through the day, like after recess, before eating, after, like, but in a more concerted effort. And I think that um, schools weren't necessarily doing that in such like there was the opportunity to but it wasn't so much a directive and so I do think that we're going to have a different emphasis in general in our society around um, hand washing so I think right now it can in a healthy way it can be a way for children to feel empowered and and their role in contributing to this is good hygiene and keeping people around them healthy by washing their hands um, and for younger kids you know there's lots of ways people have seen to like make it a game and make songs and things like that. Um, but I think that for some of our kids who are more naturally a bit anxious, there's a risk of that and we'll need to watch for that and, and kind of help them early on as much as possible. Get, but, you know, even now as parents, if you notice your child is like maybe starting to wash too long or their hands are really getting raw at this point, um, that those would be some of those signs. And I would recommend, um, you know, just kind of going, hey, like, Let's let's go back to you know singing singing a song when we do it or or kind of counting in our heads and not doing it beyond that and reinforcing kind of sticking to reasonable amounts or not doing it too much. I really don't think it's going to be kids in general. Like I think you know to my kids, like I have my reassurance seeker kid. That one will um, has that risk, and my other ones will be like, yay! I don't have to wash my hands all the time anymore. Right. So I think it's it's going to vary with various kids and their their personalities and their temperaments a little bit. Um, I think that, um, you know, when I when I speak about anxiety and I, what I've kind of alluded to a little bit 
um, already or spoken a bit about is that you know, the first steps are kind of empathizing with anxiety, with the anxiety, like validating that feeling, recognizing that it's there. It's, you know, it's, it's, it serves a purpose. There's a healthy way to have anxiety. And then there's a way that it, it gets out of control a little bit. And it gets with kids, we often use that, the idea of externalizing worries. So it's not that they are worried, but that they have worries. And with younger kids, and even up to teens, we kind of name it. And for younger kids, maybe we even draw what their worry is. So maybe we, we call it a worry, like there's the Taming Worry Dragons program. So, so a worry dragon, or a worry monster, or the worry bully, or Mr. Worry, or the, the you know, all, all those different things. So you can name it. Um, and by naming it and externalizing it, it can help because um, we can talk about it as, oh, here it is again. Like it's come in, it's like this thing that's sitting on your shoulder or this thing that's kind of around you and it's being bossy. Like, oh, I see the worry, Mr. Worry's back and he's telling you that you're supposed to wash your hands a bunch, but like you could be the boss. Like how about you boss back Mr. Worry and you tell him, no, I'm good. I did what I was supposed to. And I'm going to go back to having fun and playing my game with my friends because I really like doing that. And that's what being a kid is about. Um, you know, when I talk to kids who are worriers, I often speak to them about um, worrying as a talent. Um, and it really helps a lot of kids feel less down about their worries like it's less of a burden but actually as this kind of talent and that they can use their talent to fight their worries so um, I'll often say you know worrying is actually a talent like did you know that like you know not everybody has the kind of amazing brain that can think about worries the way you do like you have to be really imaginative and and have this like really great ability to visualize like all the possible scenarios of what could go wrong like you you have to be imaginative to be able to do that you have to have a really bright imaginative brain to think about like all the possible things that could go wrong and to be able to like see them in clear picture in your mind and that kind of comes that language comes from the taming worry dragons program so it's like a real talent for worrying and so now let's use that talent and that amazing imagination that you have to fight those worries and to boss them back and to put them in their place and so and so that you can have more fun kid time and worry free time and that's kind of the emphasis that um, I work from. And so when we're talking about specific coping skills for, um, for worries, like uh, Lynn mentioned in the introduction, I work um, from a cognitive behavioral therapy um, model, as well as, I mean, the new gener what we call the new generations of CBT or kind of mindfulness and ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And I work within those kinds of models um, and I'll speak to some of those, some tools that we use within those models now. But the first thing I wanted to say before I get into kind of specific ideas of tools that we might use, and as parents, you can kind of start to learn about or use as well, is that in these times of uncertainty and when everything, like kids aren't going to school and they're home all the time, and there's not a lot of um, structure in their lives. My number one right now is for parents to be looking at things like routines and schedules and consistency, particularly for anxious kids, but for all kids. Kids do best knowing what's coming. They know best knowing what to predict and knowing that tomorrow looks like this and the next day that's why school works so well for kids and for a lot of kids i mean obviously there are some kids that don't love that but in general especially anxious kids they do best when things are consistent and structured and i think that that is something that a lot of families are particularly struggling with in this current time because parents are both working they have meetings that they're juggling. Not every day is the same for parents. Kids aren't in school. 
like it's just feels like a lot to manage and creating a schedule feels like how do I do that? My, my days are so different. My weeks are so different. And so what I tend to recommend is if you can create a daily schedule for Monday to Friday, go for it. Like if, if there's a parent at home that can manage a schedule um, and kind of keep the kids on it, things will be smoother at home. Because kids will know, and obviously it depends on the age of your children, but, you know, so the level of support they need is different for like the primary grades, like K to three versus kind of four to seven. And then of course, high schoolers can manage a schedule relatively well with some parent support. Um, so if, if at all possible to just create a schedule, great. But it, but I think for parents who, especially those where both are uh, working at home and have younger children, sometimes that's not doable um, to kind of maintain your own work schedules and your kids. So if you can't do five days, do one or two days. Like have the two parents look at their work schedules, look at what meetings are coming up, Obviously, some things, sometimes things will get thrown with an unplanned meeting, but as much as possible, and also to ask work, like it, it's helpful for me at home to know a couple days in advance because of planning things for my kids to know when these meetings are. So as much as possible, obviously can't happen all the time, but these are general guidelines. If you can create a schedule and, you know, even if it's just the night before the two of you, the two parents sit down together, or if it's a single parent sitting down, looking at your schedule um, and then creating a schedule for the kids. And so the idea is that in that schedule is um, schoolwork time. And if your children need support around that, then that is scheduled at a time that you as a parent or one parent has flexibility to help support them with that. So um, don't schedule that at a time that no parent is able to help because that won't go well and it'll be frustrating in every way. It, it just won't work. Um, so if there's a time in your schedule that both parents are unavailable, that's a time for kids to have maybe reading time, maybe playing games, maybe screen time, something like that. Um, but ideally fitting in an appropriate amount of schoolwork time based on kind of what school is expecting and every school is very different. So I'm not going to give any kind of benchmarks on that because it, I've seen that it varies a lot based on public schools and private schools and what grades. Um, but also fitting in in that schedule, some outside time, some exercise time, that's going to be important for everybody. Um, if you can, as a parent, go with your child, I mean, obviously, if they're little, you need to do that. But even if they're a little bit older, or you're fitting in your own exercise time at a later point, that's going to be really important. So routines, consistency, schedules, really important. Um, when it comes to managing anxiety specifically, I've spoken a little bit about bossing back the worries. So that idea of kind of talking back to your worry monster being like, hey, leave me alone. I don't really, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't have to do what you're telling me to do. Um, you know, thinking about um, from a cognitive perspective, like helpful versus unhelpful thoughts. So, you know, a helpful thought um, might be something like we wash our hands uh, to keep us safe, reasonable amount of times, an unhelpful one might be, I'm not going outside because I might catch COVID, right? So, um, so noticing when we're having thoughts, like which ones are helpful versus unhelpful. I sometimes speak with um, kids about uh, our unhelpful thoughts, our worried thoughts are, are kind of, they come um, especially with teens, I talk about this, like we've evolved to have that part of our brain, like the caveman part of our brain um, is there to alert us to dangers. Like you, you want to make sure that you're on the lookout or you might get eaten by a saber toothed tiger. And if you're not listening for the little sounds, when we were cavemen, you could get eaten and that was it. So you had to be on alert. Our anxiety helped us, but also, you know, 
like for those kids and teens who worry about peers and what their peers think about them. Um, that also comes from our caveman brain because we lived in small little family units and you had to be watching what people thought of you and how they judged you because if it looked like people didn't really like you, they might kick you out of the cave and then again, you're getting eaten by the wolves. So it came, those thoughts that we have, we've evolved to have them. They were helpful at one point in our evolution. They're no longer very helpful right now. They don't save us. They don't save our lives anymore. So I sometimes talk about that with kids and teens. With little kids, I'll use things like, another tool I use a lot is detective thinking. So using facts, like being sleuths and detectives and using the facts to fight the anxiety. So, you know, what is it that you're worried about? Let's say it's, I'm worried I'm gonna catch COVID and die. Um, okay, what else could happen? Well, I could not catch it and be fine. Okay, that's a good one. What happens to like most kids in this situation? Well, most, most kids don't catch it. And if they do, they actually don't get really sick. Oh, okay. Um, so, so now that we've thought about that, sort of thought about some of the facts, like what do you think about the worried thought now? Oh, like what would be a more helpful thought now? Well, helpful thought might be, you know, even if I catch it, I'm likely to be totally safe and healthy. So that would be an example. Um, the other piece that I do a lot with is, um, is kind of mindfulness stuff. So, and, and that happens a lot within acceptance commitment therapy as well. But the idea of bringing the child or adolescent back to the present, and this is a helpful one for parents too, because our worries are all about the past or the future. They don't tend, they're not, they're not about right now. And the best way to get back into right, to get out of our worries is to get back into right now. And um, so I'll do different things to get us out of our heads and back into our space around us, our environment. So um, sometimes doing something like the five senses. So um, name five things that you see around you right now, four things that you hear, um, three things that you can touch, two things that, or that you feel on your body sometimes, two things that you smell, one thing that you taste. Um, and with little kids, you can have them run around and do that, like touch five things you see, name or like copy the sounds of things, right? So for little kids, you can make it more fun and dynamic. Um, Another one I use a lot with kids that helps with anxiety, but also with um, emotion regulation stuff, like, like big feelings in general or big outbursts, is, um, is kind of stopping where you are and finding a rainbow. And so what I mean by that is looking around, and you can do this outside or inside any room, um, look around and find something red, find something orange, yellow green, blue. And again, with kids, you can run around and touch those things, or you can just name them. You can do it in the car. You can do it anywhere. And what happens is it's getting them out of their worried thoughts and the feelings in their body and present in the environment around them, which helps to bring everything down. Um, some other things are things like meditation. So there's apps for that. A great one is on the resource page is Smiling Mind with kids, um, belly breathing, and then lots of mindful activities, like a lot of acti activities that you can do, but mindfully, like doing a puzzle, cooking, baking, reading, taking a bath or shower. Like you can do all of those things um, eating in a very mindful way. Um, I think the last thing that I want to touch on, because I'm aware of the time, is, um, is I just wanted to touch really briefly on teenagers, because um, they're a group that I would say I'm kind, in some ways most concerned about them at this time, because teenagers are super social creatures. Like, their world right now is not about their families. Um, I mean, for some it is, but in general, they're about their peers. They're about socially connecting. And we're in a time right now where we're socially distancing or physically distancing. And so, you know, number one is I try to use that difference that we are physically distancing, not socially distancing. We need to be 
creating opportunities for connection for our teens. Um, I think as parents, it's really important to know who they're talking to, um, what they're reading, what are they learning, um, you know, really watching how much time they are on, um, on electronics. I think that you know, I'm seeing that a lot of parents are kind of because they're busy and because we're all stuck at home and we don't really want a lot of conflict and fighting happening is that, you know, the easier way to do it is just to be like, go have at it, like, enjoy your phone. I'll see you and I'll see you maybe at dinner. Right. Um, so I really think it's important for parents to still set healthy limits for teens around screen use. I'm not going to give you like a time because I know people want that um, because it's not quite that simple. Like I would limit kind of um, how many hours kids are playing video games, um, but I would factor in the social aspect if, they, if there is one to the games they're playing. Um, again, I want the teens connecting socially. Um, so, you know, if they're if they're like having FaceTime chats for hours with friends, that's great, that's social. Um, if they're scrolling for hours on Instagram and not messaging friends, but just scrolling at mindful, like fo mindless photos and um, videos, not a great, not a great thing for them. So I'd really like to empower parents to kind of continue to set appropriate limits around um, screens for teens and make sure that you are taking the time to connect with them when possible and making sure that they're staying socially connected with peers in whatever way possible because I do think that that's really important for them right now. So and I think you know bottom line if you have significant concerns around how your child or adolescent is functioning right now there are still mental health supports available and um, I'll show um, I'll pull up resources um, to show you and these are also going to be Okay, so here are some articles um, around talking to kids about COVID, um, helping kids cope with stress, um, various articles um, about Corona in particular. Um, and then this is all kind of general anxiety resources. So Anxiety Canada is one that I always recommend to everybody. Um, they have so many great downloadable resources for parents to kind of help manage um, different aspects of anxiety. There's also a lot, oops, a lot of videos on there. Um, so lots of great resources. Kelty Mental Health also has lots of great resources. Um, the MindShift app, which is geared towards teens, it's put out by Anxiety um, Canada, and it's got different modules on aspects of CBT. So um, relaxation and visual imagery and how to deal with thoughts and social worries versus general worries and um, all sorts of things. So it's fantastic. Um, the Smiling Mind app is a great one. I mentioned it before for doing meditation with um, kids. So it is more geared towards younger kids and great way for them to learn some meditation and mindfulness. I don't have on here, but if you go onto YouTube also, one of my colleagues um, had sent me some videos and I didn't link them, but there's some great YouTube videos for doing mindfulness and meditation with kids. So one of them was this really cute um, puffer fish that um, fills up with air as you breathe in and, and out and it just kind of helps your kid pace their breathing and was really lovely for some of the younger kids. And there was another one that was really nice that was um, from one of the not from the Vancouver Aquarium, but it was a different one. And it was a bunch of um, jellyfish floating around while someone was speaking about meditation in this very peaceful voice. And it's lovely. So there's, but there's tons on YouTube as well. So I highly recommend looking at that. Um, and then there's a new resource here to talk, um, which is more for post-secondary students, so a little bit older. Um, 
you know, there, there still are professional mental health supports available for kids and teens right now. So even though um, we are socially um, distancing, um, we are, um, people are providing kind of video and such. Um, I think that, um, sorry, oh, my phone is going. Um, I just want to go back for a second. Um, so there's um, Child Youth Mental Health Services, the Canadian Mental Health Association's Confident Parents Thriving Kids program is, sorry about the ring, um, they provide phone coaching for parents to support your anxious child. So that is a really great um, option as a way to have like from home supports. And then um, our clinic, the North Shore Child, uh, North Shore Stress and Anxiety Clinic, sorry. Um, <clears throat> we have um, many different clinicians, so both for parents, like who work with adults, as well as for kids and teens. Um, and right now during um, COVID, we're all providing um, video sessions um, as needed. So that's an option as well. Um, so here is all of our contact information, phone, email, website, Facebook, and we have a YouTube channel as well. Um, so if anybody has questions, um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and um, the questions can go into the Q&A box specifically and I will go there to answer those questions. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'm going to answer this live. I'm not used to doing this. So I think you guys can see the question when I answer it live, um, but I'll just repeat it. Um, so given that there is a big difference between a 14 year old and a 17 and a half year old, um, with a late teen, how much should I control or limit? It's tough with older teens. Do you have any tips? So yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, once they're pretty close to out of the house at 17 and a half, it is really hard to limit their time. Um, I think, especially on phones, um, a 14 year old, I, I would recommend still um, doing some limits there. Um, for older teens, I think some of the challenges are, um, you know, I think that when, when you talk about tips, like, so for the younger teens, I, I do recommend things like, um, I off, if they're on iPhones, which a lot of them are using things like um, screen time settings, that's a huge one. And, um, and so what you can do on your iPhone, if you don't know, is you can have your, all your kids under your family and see on your phone all of their, um, their screen time use. So you see how much time they're spending in a day, which apps they spent how much time on. So you can see like, okay, they were on Instagram for three hours today and they were playing video games for four hours and they were, you know, using, um, pages for homework for like 30 minutes or whatever it is. So you can see and it gives you some visibility and then it also gives you the choice of setting up some settings around limits. And so for younger, like definitely tweens and younger teens, I definitely recommend limiting things like um, game time and aspects of social media for sure. Um, I think that, you know, for older teens, that's harder. And it's a personal decision as a parent if you want to limit it and how much. I think it's hard. I think that often what I say is look at how your child is functioning. Um, if your child is functioning well, like they're, so outside of COVID times, they're going to school, they're getting their homework done, they're getting good grades, they're seeing friends, they're volunteering, holding a job, whatever, then there's more flexibility to be had because they're showing that they can be responsible people outside of phone use and that it's not taking over their world. I think that there are important conversations to be had with a child who will forego going out with friends or is not getting work done or is not doing well in school, but is spending hours and hours and hours and hours on their phone. Like, 
it's, it's an important conversation to be had. And I think that it is not unreasonable that if your child lives in your home to set some limits on, you can have your phone like these hours and these hours, your phone stays like in the living room or next to my bed or wh wherever. I mean, the ideal I say is, is to have everybody have all their phones plugged in at night in the kitchen or wherever where nobody's using it. And as parents model good use as well. So don't be on your phone at dinner. Um, pay attention when your kids are talking to you as much as, I mean, I know now we're working and things like that. So um, I don't know that I answered that that well, but I'm going to go on to the next question. Um, okay. So my 12 year old child is extremely anxious about returning to school. She's having panic and worry about the unpre unpredictability surrounding the possibility of schools opening again to some degree. How can I best manage this? Um, so some of the questions I would have would be to find out what it is she's worried about. Um, understanding is she, is she worried because she doesn't know and the uncertainty or is she worried because she could go back and people could get sick so you know understanding the worry and providing some facts around it um tolerating unpredictability is a hard thing for a lot of people a lot of adults don't do a good job with tolerating uncertainty um so a lot of that is validating that and then it's doing some general anxiety management work. So some of that stuff like um, relaxation, meditation, like bringing the general anxiety levels in her body down by doing regular kind of anxiety management from a behavioral perspective. What can we do to calm her down, to calm her mind? Let's look at what those worries are. Are those, you know, that same idea, is that a helpful thought to like worry about like, you know, what if I don't know when I'm going to go back to school. Okay, how is how is that helping right now? Like that's, those are those kinds of worries that um, at this moment are, we're now in the future, we're not in the present, right? So how I was talking about being present and, and mindful in the moment, let's focus on um, I get that worry. I totally understand it. I understand that you're worried. How do we, how do we focus on right now? How do we bring our worries down? We can't really do anything about that. Worrying about it isn't going to help us know, like some of those kinds of things. Um, and if you find that your child is really anxious, like when you talk about having panic and worry, um, I would recommend possibly seeking out some resources, even if it's just a little bit of anxiety management to help her with that. Um, it might be um, a good option for her. Um, uh, okay, let me just, sorry, read these for a sec. Um, I'm going to try to answer this, but I'm not sure that I have enough information to. So how to help a five-year-old who decided she's bad, um, because some of the family members got a flu and they were worried that she might pass it on to someone else even though she, she might not so you, the parents were concerned that she would pass it on even though she didn't have any symptoms and so she decided she's bad um so i mean i think i would be looking at that thought um at five that's hard though kids aren't making those connections so at five um you're not doing as much cognitive work you're doing more um behavioral stuff and so you can label it like mm, that's a that's sounds like the worries are back oh the worries are bugging you or um you know i definitely want to give her sorry i'm just reading it again um that she might pass it on or she yeah, I mean, I would do a little bit about that reassurance that, yeah, we were worried because a lot of people were worried, but, you know, she was fine. She did she did what she needed to do. You guys all did what you needed to do and everybody got through it and we're healthy and fine. And so I would kind of do a little bit of that reassurance to let her know, like, 
she's not bad. It was fine. She did. She was a typical five-year-old like, and that you were just doing your job as a parent and she was doing what she does as a five-year-old. I'm not sure that that's answering that that well, but um, I don't have all of the information. Um, okay. Um, can you propose these meditation moments within the school system? I think there's a lot of evidence and research out there already about providing mindfulness moments and meditation moments within the school systems. I think that they know about it. I don't think that this is new. Um, I think that each school is a little bit different in how much they take these things on and focus on it. Um, so I, um, you know, my recommendation as, a parent would be to approach your own school district and ask what their plans are around that or is that something they're willing to do. Um, every school district has a school district office with special education services folks and so um, as a parent you could always reach out either at your school level or your district level to talk about implementing mindfulness but it can also be done at the classroom level so you could just speak to the the child's teacher about that. Um, so the the parent that asked again about, I'm just making sure I have the right one, the five-year-old who um, thinks she's bad. So, um, so uh, mentioning that the five-year-old now panics um, when people come too close and she wants to run away. Um, I think that's a healthy balance. So, um, you know, obviously we want to maintain physical distancing. So when she's, uh, worried that people are getting too close. I don't know if people genuinely are getting too close and that's an okay reaction to be like, hey, like that's too close and, um, and crossing the street if you feel like that's going to be too close. But if she's like panicking and running away when people are nowhere near, then I would be doing things like, um, especially at five, like reinforcing, let's say with a sticker sheet for every time she manages to walk by people and not try to run away or just hold steady and hold your hand and, and have a little squeeze and keep walking. So I would be reinforcing um, when she is able to manage her anxiety and not panic and run away. And um, it's, and again, validate, like, it's okay to have some worries. It feels a little uncomfortable. We're all getting used to this new situation, but we can do it. And so I would set up some sort of a reward system where you reward her for managing her anxiety and not having kind of a uh, too big reaction to um to that um to to coming close to someone um i think that's all the questions that i have right now um if there are no further questions then we will wrap up for today great <laughs> um that's wonderful thank you so much susan i I learned so much. I don't have any kids at home right now, but I, I can use some of these techniques when I'm talking to them on the phone. Thank <laughs> you so much. And thank you to all the attendees. Thanks for connecting in with the library tonight for our virtual program. I hope that, uh, hope that I'll be able to see you all again soon in person, maybe a while, but uh, in the meantime, we'll ha we have lots of other virtual programs if you wanna um, check out our website. So thanks again and uh, everybody have a good evening and Great. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everyone.